Welcome to the DFO Rundown Podcast with Frank Saravalli and Jason Greger on dailyfaceoff.com. Delivered by DoorDash. Welcome to episode 145 of the DFO Rundown as we are uh, days away from NHL free season. Uh, I'll start that again. That was a fuck up. All right. Coming down in uh, three, two, and one. Welcome to episode 145 of the DFO Rundown. I'm Jason Greger alongside Frank Saravalli, and episode 145 is brought to you by Three Ice. It's overtime all the time. Led by six Hall of Famers, Guy Carbono, Larry Murphy, Grant Fuhrer, Joe Mullen, John LeClaire, and Brian Trotche. Three Ice is hitting uh, eight cities over nine weeks, including two stops in Canada, coming up uh, on July 16th in London, Ontario, and in Quebec City on July 30th. Get your tickets today at 3ice.com. That's the number 3ice.com. Come as uh, Frank, uh, we are uh, Monday night when we're recording this. Uh, free agency begins on uh, Wednesday. We've already had some uh, some big moves, so let's get to the uh, the trade that the that just happened as we're uh, recording this. Uh, Matt Murray was traded from Ottawa to Toronto. Toronto gets Matt Murray. They also get a third rounder and a seventh rounder, and uh, Ottawa retains twenty five percent of the salary. Basically, uh, Ottawa um, paid. $2 million to, um, well, yeah, now not even, yeah, two, just under two mil to, uh, to take, have Toronto take Murray off their hands and they gave him two draft picks. Yeah. I mean, we heard the rumored trade that was supposed to go down between Buffalo and Ottawa, very similar in, in nature. And Matt Murray flexed the no trade card, uh, on Ottawa, understandably so, you know, player earns that right. It was up to the Sens to work with Mary more closely and getting that done beforehand. Uh, that's exactly actually what the Toronto Maple Leafs did with Peter Morazic. He, the Blackhawks ended up not being on his no trade list, but he waived completely his no trade because he wanted to facilitate a move. I don't know exactly what was presented to Morazic, but thinking back to the spot that he was in with his contract, I think the Leafs, since they weren't planning on bury, uh, buying him out, they were planning on basically burying him in the minors with the Marlies. And so sort of if you're reading between the lines for P Peter Morazic, it was, you know, you can either go to the AHL and play there or we can trade you to another NHL team. And you'll have an opportunity to play lots of games, which he'll do in Chicago. Uh, now the Leafs were in a spot entering Monday morning where they didn't have any goaltender of NHL caliber under contract. Um, and I, it's a roll of the dice. I think that's the best way to put it with Matt Murray. This is a straight up gamble and he's got the pedigree two time Stanley cup winner. They've got the familiarity with him having played for Kyle Dubas and Sheldon Keefe in Sault Ste. Marie. And they've got the medical records to say that he's healthy. That's been the big question mark. Yes, Matt Murray's game has suffered. Yes, he's had a loss of confidence, but he's also struggled to stay on the ice. And so that would be the first part of this solving this riddle or solving this problem for Matt Murray to get his career back on track would just be staying upright. So that would be a step in the right direction. And now I think of utmost importance for Toronto is to get a second goaltender to play in tandem with Murray that you can trust should Mary falter. So basically, if you want to think of it from this perspective, the Leafs more or less signed Matt Murray to a two-year deal for $4.7 million, which is way more than he would have gotten on the market given his play. But given the picks that are added in to soften a bit of that blow, maybe it makes it a little bit easier to, to stand. I can just tell you the reaction, Jason, on social media and from Leaf fans everywhere is, I can't believe we're betting this 100-plus point roster on Matt Murray. Yeah, it's a it's a bold risk. And it, it's interesting. So you mentioned Frank, 4.7 for Matt Murray. Free agency begins on Wednesday. And uh, but legally, Toronto hasn't even talked to Darcy Kemper. Um, that, that I find that a tad odd. I just I, I'm not a big believer, uh, unfortunately, that uh, some teams all play by the rules or not. And, and maybe they've gotten wind that, uh, you know, he's going somewhere. Suddenly, Washington has gotten rid of both of their goalies here. And uh, yeah, I find sense. that to be the most curious dot to connect is all of a sudden they trade Vanacek and now they don't qualify Samsonov. Yeah. Huh. 
Huh. That's weird. Goaltending is at a scarcity at the moment, and you've now deleted two from your roster. Yeah, that were both so, under team control. Yeah, so magically, Dar like if I was connecting dots, Darcy Kemper to uh, Washington, and uh, now obviously Toronto knew where they were with Jack Campbell, and uh, felt like maybe they weren't on the same page. And I'm curious to see what kind of contract Jack Campbell's going to be because you mentioned two years at four point seven for Matt Murray. Is Jack Campbell going to get much more than 4.7 on the open market? Like I was looking at, at other deals and Markstrom got 6 million. I don't put Campbell in that in that category. Um in re- recent contract signings like Billy Huso got 4.75. Campbell probably maybe get pushes up to 5 million, right? Freddie Anderson only got 2 years uh in in Carolina. So I'm I'm kind of curious to see what Jack Campbell gets and this will be one where if Campbell signs for whatever it is 5 over 5 and Matt Murray was two over 4.7 and, and Toronto's got to be in a kind of win today, not worrying about five years down the road kind of mode. Uh, they're going to need Murray. And I know that they believe that in a, and I think they, uh, they believe that in a better structured system that, uh, that Matt Murray can come back and Hey, Matt Murray in Pittsburgh was pretty good. No one debates that, but that's, that's many years ago. So who knows? Maybe, maybe Frank, Matt Murray will be, he's kind of, he's, he's going to take a page from the Valerie Nichushkin. Uh, playbook because in 2019 Valerie Nichushkin had zero goals in 57 games and he got bought out of his contract fast Wait, can forward I just finish off that thought though before you move on you asked what the market is for Campbell you mentioned five over five I think that's exactly the neighborhood that Jack Campbell's living in and Darcy Kemper um if I were to predict, and I again, I don't know anything for certain because no no one's willing to talk about these things, obviously, if any rules are being broken. The rumor, the word is that Darcy Kemper was operating in a world that was five and a half times five. So um, my sense is the Leafs went with Matt Murray, probably a less than optimal choice because they got some intel on what the market has provided or what's left on the market. And they felt like that was their next best move. Yeah. They like, had an opportunity for a long time to get this done with Jack Campbell, just yeah. like they had an opportunity for a long time to get a contract done with Zach Hyman last year and waited until the 11th hour. And then all of a sudden circled back and said, Hey, can we get something done? And I think by that point it was like, well, you had your chance. And by the way, that kind of feels like exactly what's happening right now with Evgeny Malkin. <laughs> yeah. Uh, although Malkin, you know, all the reports are he wants a four-year deal. Now I'll get to Malkin in a sec, but I want to go back to Nishushkin because Sorry. When, when you go zero, to close that off. zero goals in 57 games in 2019, you get your contract bought out. And three years later, you sign a $50 million contract. Kids. Never give up believing on yourself. As the great Stuart Smalley said, I'm good enough. I'm smart enough. <laughs> and uh, man, so maybe Matt Murray's Nikushkin, Frank. Maybe after three years of you know struggling, he'll refine his game. Because uh, that, I'll say this about Nikushkin. Good for him. But I, I was stunned. Like eight years? Like t- to me. a lot of money. It's a lot. Staple, it's, it's guys. Also, it, the AAV feels high a little bit. And the term. And the term, it, it's not like one or the other. Like usually if the term's high, you're like, oh, well, that means it's a lower AAV to, to be more cap friendly. I, I don't know. Um, maybe that's what was out there on the market for Valerie Nichushkin. Like maybe that's the type of world that he was living in. I, I don't. Um... He got 1 million per point, Frank. One, he scored 52 points last year and he just signed for $50 million. Yep, it sounds like a lot. You you know, I heard this theory while I was at the draft, and I forget which GM I was talking to. Yeah, and he said, I think I told you this, or maybe a million for every 10 points. Yeah, a million for every 10 points. 6.125 is a lot different than 5.2 mm-hmm. for Valerie Nichushkin. You know, you think about the, the deals that are gonna be signed this summer. Nazem Kadri probably in the eights. 87 million. Uh, Johnny Gaudreau could potentially be in the tens, 115 points. Um, hang on a sec. Tyler, can you pause this? I mean, when you think about it, it makes sense. Nazem Kadri, 87 points, probably somewhere in the eights. 
Johnny Gaudreau, 115 points, could have an AAV that starts with a 10. Uh, go down the list, even some of the smaller guys with ARB cases, you, you saw so many QOs that were not offered. The reason is teams are afraid with little cap space of what the arbitration or arbitrator might award. And so a guy that has 37 points is probably in the three and a half million dollar range. So it actually is a nice, you know, handy guide ruler, if you will, to do it, you know, sort of back of the napkin math and figure out where a guy might end up being. Yeah, it, it's definitely a good, uh, good tool to use at times. Um, the other one you look at lately is if you're like a, a half a point a game player, which is which is 40 points and 80, that kind of gets you three mil, at least for arbitration cases. And, you know, the, the Devils, they actually elected to take Miles Wood to uh, arbitration, which doesn't happen very often. They announced that uh, earlier today. So that's uh, that's a, an interesting one where a lot of teams, Frank, like the free agent market suddenly got a lot deeper, uh, m- maybe more at the at the bottom end of the free agent pool. Yeah, where that's what I was thinking. It's probably more bottom end guys, right? Yeah. Like, but I'm you're having think, guys as like I've been doing this. How many of these guys that didn't get qualified today are going to end up in my top 50? Well, Dylan Strom and Kubelik, maybe. They, they're in there already. We had yeah. them this, up this morning. I would say probably Sonny Milano is another one. Um, the guy Heinen. who had a quiet, who had a quiet, good year was Brett Howden in Vegas, right? Younger player who's just starting to get his feet wet. Like he'll sign for a lower term. Uh, I would think than other guys, but th- there's a guy who's, you know, he's, he's a competitive player, highly competitive player can kill penalties. Um, I think he'll have some value to teams. I'm, I'm curious to see what a guy like, like there's a lot of non big name guys, but here's the thing, Frank, I believe you win free agency when you're going down the bargain bin aisle and, and, uh, and there's going to be a lot Andre of guys. Kasha is, is a good example of that. He's one guy that I think helps you win. He's going to be on my top 50 somewhere, probably in the, you know, high twenties, low thirties that, um, you know, just like you mentioned competitive guy, like that's what sets players like him apart is their compete level and all the other things they do for you when they're not scoring. I think you're, you're going to see some young players, Frank, who, who you use that word competitiveness, who I think some teams felt like they didn't have it on a night to night basis. And they're going to be facing two way contracts to try to have to show teams that, Hey, um, you know, if you want to, if you want to get back in the NHL, you're going to have to sign it a, a two-way deal. Now, sure, you might get 150 or 200. You're not going to get like you know 70,000 like your ELC, but it's a, it's a real dog eat dog world out there now. And the top end, you know, are making so much more of the money in the flat cap era that the the middle and the bottom guys are just getting squeezed tighter and tighter all the time. Left and right, they're getting squeezed. It's there's no harder time, I think, to be a free agent as a three or four million dollar player then right now uh that'll change when the cap goes back up i think but i also think teams have recognized that you don't want to be paying guys that are pay- playing in your bottom six three and a half million bucks or 2.75 million bucks it, it doesn't work it may work for one year but it doesn't work on a four-year deal it's different if you're paying a guy that's you know playing spot you know f- second pair or third pair minutes that you can sort of adjust and move all over your lineup defensively, but it doesn't work for third line guys. No, not at all. So now let's look at some of the, uh, the top names on your board, Frank, obviously Johnny Gaudreau has been at the top. Philip Forsberg signed. We talked about that uh, on Friday from the draft where we said it was close and he gets the eight years, 8.5 in, in Nashville. So Johnny Gaudreau, Nazem Kadri uh, are at the top. What's your sense, you know, uh, Johnny Gaudreau, you know, New Jersey, Philly have, and Calgary have been talked about for a long time. I don't think it's a big surprise, but what's your sense telling you about Nazem Kadri and, and who might be going after him? Massive money. Um, I think for sure it's an AAV that starts with an eight. Um, curious about the term because he is a little bit older. He's almost for sure not going back to Colorado. And I've just heard repeatedly that one team that has set Nazem Kadri above and beyond on their list is the New York Rangers. Really? I don't, I don't know about some of the others, but that seems to be one. I think they view him as like plug him right in. He's going to take over Ryan Strom's minutes, Ryan Strom's, you know, everything be there to see for the next, however long. And that's that. Hmm. They loved his compete in the playoffs. Yeah. 
So the Rangers for uh, for Kadri. Um... And that's just a pure. By the way, like some of these, you know, I'll let you, the listener, decide what is you know cooked and what isn't. I that one, I don't think is. The, I uh, truly think that's one of those. There's a few guys that are, you know, 12 noon, like the clock is really just starting. Yeah. So uh, Rangers there. That makes sense. Um, you know, you've, you've been all over the Gaudreau and Calgary right from the get go. And, um, you know, th- this is unlike other years, Frank, where we talked earlier about how teams came back at the last minute with the final offer. Toronto's been, I mean, Calgary's been full court pressed the entire time on Johnny Gaudreau. And now maybe he comes back at the last minute. And uh, and pulls a, a Gabriel Landeskog like last year, or do you think he's going to market and then uh, isn't coming back? I I don't have ev- any evidence to point to. As much as I think things have been positive at times and also waffled negative, I don't have any evidence to point to to say that Johnny Gaudreau is going to circle back. It's gone on so long. There's been so little traction, so little communication. You know, they've, I I should take that part back. They've communicated fine throughout the process and have been in touch at all points. But there's been no, like, it's like, hey, when can we negotiate? When can we, you know, when can we really begin to dig in here? And and it's like, you know, Johnny's trying to make up his mind. That's, that's been the refrain time after time after time. And When you get six weeks in, seven weeks in, that's how long it's been since the Flames bowed out in the Battle of Alberta in the second round, that if Johnny Gaudreau is coming back, he's he's got a really weird way of showing it. You know, where's the love? Like, I, the Flames have given him plenty. They've put a massive offer on the table. They're willing to go deeper. And yet there's been no movement. So no, nothing to point to. There's nothing that I can say at this moment, Monday night, 830 Eastern, July 11th, as we're barely 24 hours away from the Flames losing their ability to offer an eighth year, which basically makes their offer the same as everyone else's. They lose their big chip in 24 hours. So the fact that nothing's changed on Monday, that really seemed to be the day that you know, if it was going to happen, rubber was going to meet the road. And I, I just don't, I've heard nothing new to this point. And again, all of that subject will change. Maybe something does happen. I just don't have anything that I can tangibly point to and say, yes, you know, Cal, he's going to circle back to Calgary. Well, um, Ken Holland uh, and the orders gave uh, Evander Kane um, freedom to talk to other teams, Frank. And, and uh, Evander Kane wants term on top of a, of a big ticket here. And um, I, I'm curious if a team would be willing to go even five years uh, with Evander Kane when you consider on ice. I don't think there's any question about his ability, but he, he does have, you know, two franchises in Winnipeg and San Jose where teammates were just like, okay, hey, we're done. And, and I wonder how much, if any, that plays a factor in the term for, uh, for Evander Kane. Cause I can how tell you, I think it? like the NHL, I think is hoping that he gets a longer term deal and then just drops the lawsuit and they just, walk that's away not happen. from San Jose. And I agree with you, but I think that's what the NHL is hoping will happen. Um, and that's that the, by the way, like the Oilers, I think have tried to be very creative in offering solutions to help end this dispute and maybe even coax San Jose into the idea of ending it uh, with Evander Kane, a settlement. They, I, I think they've sort of proposed the idea of like, Hey, we will, Whatever you don't get from San Jose will make you whole, will top you up. That has been of no interest. My sense is that Evander Kane has said to them, at least through his agent, has said, whatever happens on the settlement is one thing, and whatever happens on the contract front and free agency is another. Those are two separate issues, and if he gets money from both, that Evander Kane, the plan is to double dip. And I have no... like. There's no issue with that whatsoever. Uh, that is certainly his prerogative and right to do so. Uh, there also is a chance that the Sharks just win the grievance case and he ends up with nothing, mm-hmm. uh, which should be considered. But what I love from the Edmonton Oilers is Evander Kane's camp, as they met on Sunday, has remained incredibly steadfast in their belief that they're getting somewhere between 40 to $50 million on the open market which by pure math would indicate that they think that they can get a six or a seven year deal from somewhere. I don't know where that is, but what I love about what the Oilers have done is they're like, 
Go ahead. You think you can get it, go do it. And mm -hmm. we'll see how that works out. They've essentially called Evander Kane's bluff and said, we gave you a lifeline. We put you in a perfect spot to succeed and it's been mutually beneficial. We'd like to continue the relationship. We've made what we feel is a fair offer given your circumstances and your, and your past history. There were various reports on Monday that it was either a three or a four year deal. I don't think they were willing to go beyond that. No. And understandably so. Like I, that's that he wears out his welcome. So if you can get a six or a seven year deal, by all means, go ahead. I, I just, Personally, and it only takes one. I just don't know who's doing it. Well, and then the other thing comes down to the, the teams that can do it, Frank, are teams that are likely in a position not to be competitive. So does he just want the money or does he want to be on a competitive team? Well, because I think he needs the, the money. Yeah. So, um, and if, if that's it's what it's all about, like no issue there either. Like you've got your life to live and your own obligations. So I get it. Um, you know, I would say that it was interesting to me to hear that after all that stuff became public today and some other names seem to be linked to the Oilers through various reports, um, including Connor Brown and some others, that all of a sudden it, it sounded at least initially like the Kane camp may have changed their tune. Well, what do you mean you're thinking of other guys? So I don't know. Maybe that's uh, maybe the Oilers have successfully called that bluff and maybe they end up working something out. I don't know. Yeah, there, there is a lot of there because I look at Gaudreau and Kadri and, and Kane and Klingberg and Kemper as I think the guys who are probably going to get the most money at their position that are free agents. But then there's a bunch of guys who are really good players, right? Like you got Trocheck and, and you got Nita Ryder and you got Strom and you got Cop and you go down the list of other, you know, Jack Campbell, et cetera. Although we, I think both of us agree we think Campbell's probably going to Edmonton. But what, what do you make of, you know, the Carolina Hurricanes? And I know that they think that the Cockney Emmys is going to take one of those guys' spots. And, and he very well He's, might that's the do plan. that. Yep. But um, where do you see landing spots for Trocek and, and Nita Ryder? And what's what's the market for guys like that? Are they $5 million players for like three years? I think or so. Or they get longer? I, I No, I, I don't know about term, but I think so. Um, there seem to be some interest in Trocheck in Detroit. Um, he did play his junior hockey in Michigan, both Saginaw and Plymouth, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Pittsburgh kid. Um, I'm sure they're watching the situation with Evgeny Malkin and what happens there. And I'm, I think the Penguins would be wise to try and get in on that if they could. Uh, don't know if that's going to be possible. Cop, I think, is looking at a longer term. I think he's in like the six times six neighborhood. What? Yep. Wow. Very close to it. If not, you know, five years times six million, five years times five, seven, five. That's the type of world cops in. He's just such a smart player and he's reliable. He plays both ends. He scores you 50 points and he's a really good player. Yeah. Um, I don't know where he's of, going though. I don't know where yeah. that, that fit is. Well, see, that's, that's the question, right? Some guys are going to, if they want the money and I understand to get in the security for life, I totally get it, but you, you might be lowering your odds of being on a competitive team. That's just, it's very, I don't few think so. Teams. I think cop is looking at five, somewhere between five to 10 teams with significant serious interest that are all in the upper echelon of the NHL. Well, I guess Colorado, if they're losing Codry, right. They could, uh, they could do it. There'd be a whole host of teams that would love to get Andrew Cop. If Jenny Malkin and Pittsburgh Penguins, it uh, sounds like uh, he's going to go to market. Frank, uh, I, I put it out there already, uh, just for the sheer storyline. Uh, Malkin in Wa in Washington would be my favorite landing spot for Jenny Malkin. I'm not sure it's realistic, but it would be interesting. Um, I'm very curious because Malkin was a point of game player last year, but unfortunately he missed half the season. Right, like he when he's in the lineup, he's still a highly productive player but he misses quite a bit, quite a few games uh, every year, last year being 40 games. Um, wh where do you, what do you make of Malkin? Do you think there's any chance him and the Penguins will reunite? I think there is some chance. Um, 
I think the Penguins were absolutely floored when they got the call on Monday. And I think it's, you know, it's funny. This lingered on for so long that I just mentioned some of the other deals where it was like, you had a real opportunity to just get this done and end it, that the Penguins seem to be their own worst enemy here. Um, I don't know that it's totally, I don't know that the door is totally closed yet on Malkin and Pittsburgh, but it feels like it's trending in that direction. Um, there was all sorts of back and forth in the reporting on Sunday and Monday about Malkin and the details. The clearest indication I have and not gospel is that the Penguins did put a fourth year on the table. And I think that was the sticking point the entire time. But I think what happened was it came too late. Um, I don't know. I don't know the total, you know, breakdown, but it seemed like what they were trying to do was get Evgeny Malkin on a deal for four years in the same sort of AAV window as Chris Letang. And I think he was so bothered by the idea of like, Hey, i you know, like Latang, I helped deliver you three Stanley Cups. I won a hard trophy. I've got a Con Smythe trophy. Um, why hasn't there been more respect? And I don't know. I would argue, given the injuries, the term and dollar that he's been provided is probably pretty fair. I agree. Uh, but I'm also not Evgeny Malkin, and I don't, you know, I don't know what it's like to go through that, you know, situation as a Hall of Fame player. Um, I wonder if he's willing to go somewhere on a one-year deal at a higher AAV just to see what it's like. And I, they don't have any cap space, but if Genny Malkin lives in Florida, he lives on Fisher Island, actually, one of the most exclusive zip codes in the world. And I wonder about the Panthers. Oh, yeah. Hey, um, like the, the one name that – that I, I I've heard people connecting Claude Giroux to Edmonton, Frank. I just, I can't see it. I don't see how a guy who's going to be 35 next season is suddenly going to leave the, uh, the, the easy, pretty travel of Philly. And I know he played briefly in Florida to want to go to Edmonton, which is one of the tougher travel schedules in the NHL. Like I just, I'd be flabbergasted. I don't think by that's that. a possibility. Yeah. Like I don't, I, I don't think if either. Evander Kane's not coming back, I think some of the options for Edmonton include David Perron, Yep. Um, I think they would include, I don't know. I don't have the list in front of me as to what I was, you know, trying to map out that might make sense, but I think Perron would be in that group. Um, you know, need a rider. I don't think stylistically that's the type of fit that they'd like. He doesn't, you can say a lot about Perron, but man, that dude's got an edge to his game. Oh, well that, you know, does not have that. No, the, the order is they need some, like Dylan Strom doesn't have that either. And I know no. there's a lot of people trying to connect him and McDavid. And I'm just like, I, the junior I don't connection. Really, the, I don't see that. I mean, it's possible. I don't, I don't see that. No, no. I, uh, um, you know who I like for Edmonton, Frank? Pastor it's Frank Vitrano. That's a guy. And I actually like Frank Vitrano for a lot of teams. Frank Vitrano is basically a three-time 20-goal scorer who no one ever talks about as a 20-goal scorer. What a pickup that was. And that was one thing going back to Florida and, and their yeah. season. Some hubris there, I think, in terms of how that worked out. You know, offloading Frank Vetrano as a cap casualty to bring in some of these other guys, and he outplayed them, frankly, in the Rangers playoff run. Hey, I like Frank Vetrano a lot. I think there's a lot of team like that guy. He, he, I think he's, he's going to be in my bargain bin shopping, Frank, because for whatever reason, there's going to be other guys who are going to get more money than him. And I don't think there, I don't think they bring as much. He's he, I like, he's competitive. He's a smart player. He's got an ability to finish. Um, I, I like Vitrano a lot. And I look at teams like the, you know, if the Calgary flames lose Johnny Gaudreau, I'm fascinated what angles they're going to go at. Um, you know, cause then there's the whole Matthew Kachuk scenario. Now let's move to the back end, Frank. And the biggest name out there is of course, uh, John Klingberg, um, uh, Mike Greer today in San Jose, I keep telling you my report, I, you know, I'm, if there's one trade, I think it's burns to Dallas later on. So keep thinking about that. Mike Greer didn't, uh, didn't put any, uh, water on that, uh, uh, Gr uh, burns trade rumor today, but John Klingberg is the one defenseman. I'm very intrigued to see, you know, what he gets his term. Like 
can he get in the same category of the guys last year or is he coming a step below them at the nine million range like nine Wierens million like Wierenski got nine million I don't even think he's in the eights yeah okay well that's what I'm asking but it, yeah it's I, don't, I don't uh I don't know I you just hit me like with a brick when you asked me that I'm but they like, jumped up out of nowhere last year. I felt like it. No one thought anybody was going to get nine. All of a sudden, four guys got nine million last summer. Like I agree with you. I don't think he's there, but I didn't think any of them were at nine million last year. Well, I think there's been a correction kind of since then, right? Like if you if all those teams could do all those deals over, aside from Macar, right? Like all well, those yeah, teams he's could, yeah, he wasn't a UFA. They're, so, yeah. they're probably all wanting do overs, aren't they? Well, yeah, yeah, but. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean it only the, takes one as we've yeah, said. Exactly. So I, I don't, uh, I don't know. I, I don't, I think he's in like the mid sevens. And I, for some reason, Frank, the the Seattle Kraken, I don't know why I think they got money to spend. And for some reason, they were that's rumored. it makes sense. I mean, I kind of makes sense. He's, he's on the younger end of free agency, someone that can be there for a while and they've got money to spend and would like to improve. It's not now, necessarily about next year for John Klingberg and the crack. If he were to go to the crack and no. it would be about two years three from years. now or whenever it is three years. From yeah. Now. So, um, any, anything uh, new on some of your trade bait board guys, has anything changed uh, since the draft Petrie Krug, those type of guys? No, I think Montreal is still working on, on Petrie. I think the blues have tried to create some salary cap space. I reported, you know, just before we did the pod that, David Perron is likely heading to market. And the reason for that is they can't actually make him a bona fide offer right now because they don't have cap space. Um, there seemed to be some rumor that popped up over the last couple of days. I hadn't seen it in many places, but Joel Edmondson was rumored from Montreal. I don't, I don't think they're moving Edmondson. Um, the D market kind of gets thin in a hurry, doesn't it? It like does. You, you've got, the, the top end guy in Klingberg and Latang was up there and you know, the fall off is pretty swift. Is it not? Oh, it's like I, Brett Kulak and uh, he, he might be the, the number one uh, left D potentially um, out there. Possibly. Now you, you, some, some will ben argue Sherrod that is in that. Yeah. Sherrod might be the other one, but you know, either way, it's not like there's, you know, there's some good quality, you know, number four defensemen out there, some third pairing guys, you know, uh, Zadorov is out there. Um, Erica Branson, I think uh, changed a lot of people's minds and how he played last year in that, in that system in Calgary where, uh, you know, big physical defensemen. So, um, you know, you just you don't want those guys. You don't want Zadorov to have to play against McDavid. That's all right. Like he can, uh, right. he can light you up. That's the difference. Kulak. Um, I think it's too soon to call right now, whether he goes to market or not. I think the Oilers with their cap space, were hoping to have more traction to this point on Kulak. I think it's fair to say, uh, but I think they were scheduled to meet on Monday afternoon. And I don't know the end result of that. I think they've gone back and forth on a number of different options, including some longer term deals. And then, you know, I think the thought process from cool accent was, should we go shorter term, go like two years, something like that, maybe at a little bit of a higher AAV to see if we could cash in later. Um, so I think all options are still on the table with Kulak and the Oilers. I, you know, after losing Duncan Keith, they'd really like to, at least have, you know, some bodies back there with experience. Um, Tyson Barry, it's interesting though. We talked about this last or two pods ago, I think when we were in person in Montreal and just because Keith is not coming back doesn't mean, and by the way, the Oilers are expected to have a press conference on Tuesday, uh, formally announcing Duncan Keith's retirement. They wanted to give him a big send off, which I understand for a hall of famer. And by all accounts, he loved his time in Edmonton. Um, Tyson Barry is still a viable trade target. JT Miller. JT Miller. I, I can't figure that one out to save the life of me. So I'm not even going to speculate. There was lots of reporting about the Oiler, or not the Oilers, excuse me, the Canucks and the Islanders. And... I don't know where that went, what happened there. Um, they seem to deny it. 
Lou Lamorello saying immediately afterwards, um, you need to ask Vancouver, which I thought was great. And I think what's happened with Miller is a lot of these teams that have money to spend, um, or at least are in contender mode and are looking for pieces, they're thinking, well, since we need to pay JT Miller anyway, is it rather than give up mega assets yeah. to get him, is it worth just going on the free agent market? Cause you can get a guy who maybe is younger or the same age. JT Miller's going to the, the first, when the first year of his next deal ends, he's going to be 31. Can you get a player who's younger and not give up any assets that ultimately gives you a similar or same type impact? And I think that's what some of those teams are considering. And, I, and the other thing I heard on Miller was not as many teams were in on it as you think. So significant interest, but not as many teams. All right. Uh, we're going to get to uh, fill in the blank in a second. Uh, brought to you by the 2022 double IHF world juniors what's a better way uh, to cool off uh, this summer than in the rink during the first ever summer world juniors of course uh, postponed from uh, december uh, single game tickets for the tournament are on sale now starting at just 40 bucks so uh, grab your sunglasses the brightest stars in the junior game are coming to edmonton for the uh, 2022 double ihf world juniors ty how you doing I am ready to go with a new edition of fill in the blank delivered by DoorDash. Rundown DD gets you 25% off and no delivery fees on your first order. Wednesday free agency. That's a great day to just sit on Twitter all day and not worry about cooking. Uh, let's dig into it with a little bit of the news that we got today of the RFA options who were not qualified. The most surprising name on the non-qualified list is blank. Frank? Probably Sonny Milano. Um, he was a huge part of the Trevor Zegers goal played so well with Zegers 14 goals younger player Anaheim has no cap space issues needs to spend 17 million dollars to get to the floor none of these QOs like really are like earth shattering but I felt like that would have just been an easy one to bring back for one more year and then see what happens yeah, I'm going to go with Ilya Samsonov. I know they're worried about a uh, potential arbitration case, but they don't have a goalie right now. Now, I, which leads me to believe they might know who their goalie is. But, um, you know, he's 25 years of age. And historically, when you look at goalies, lots of them don't find their way at the NHL level. You know, some would argue that he probably got rushed. They should have kept him in the American League for another year and just let him develop longer because it's hard to develop in the NHL. I strongly believe the NHL is not a developmental league, right? It's a production league and it's hard, but that's the reality of it. So I'm going to go with Samson off because he's a young goalie, 25. And, uh, and now I think some team, right. You might not get the best out of Samson off this year, but man, I'd be very intrigued to want to sign him to a multi-year deal. And I think that that guy could really pan out and be a steal in the future. He's also someone that's homegrown and has pedigree first round pick in 2015. I think it was. So that's, it's a really good pick Jay. Um, they think he's somewhere between three and three and a half on an ARB case, and they simply can't afford to pay that given what they're likely to pay their next guy. And, <laughs> uh, and so now they're in a spot where they got to get someone cheaper, but that someone cheaper is also going to need to be a contributor. So that's the other really interesting part of free agency is like, yeah, the starters are one thing. It feels like all those chairs are kind of spoken for, but what about all the backups? There aren't enough to go around like some team somewhere is going to have to go find themselves a Vejmelka or someone like last year the Coyotes did that just you'd never heard of before. Yeah, San Jose's got three goalies. i got to think they're going to be moving one of them, right? They just qualified Cap, Okak, and, and Aiden Hill. I'm not saying any of those guys are, are, are world busters. They probably want to keep James Reimer, but he's probably the, the most tradable of the three. Interesting. Yeah, Reimer, a dependable veteran who put up some really good numbers for San Jose last season. Uh, let's go to the UFAs. You know, there's a lot of talk and we're all chuckling in the talk on Twitter. Oh, we know where like three or four guys are going. Like, come on. But who is the UFA you're most intrigued to see, you know, the situation play out on Wednesday, Jason? Well, I think it's Evander Kane because we're still, we don't know about what's uh, going to happen with San Jose. Um, our team's going to give him term. He's just coming off the greatest four months of his career. 
right? He scored 22 goals in 39 regular season games that he added 15 or sorry, 13 goals in the, in the postseason uh, for the Edmonton orders. Like those, those are huge numbers, huge numbers. And will a team want to give term because I don't think anybody really, I don't think giving him the salary is the big issue, right? He had a $7 million salary before he just scored that. You're like, oh, okay, he's a $7 million player. That's fine. Yeah. It's more so the term. So I'm intrigued by uh, by that uh, fall very closely by Johnny Gaudreau, man, because that's the second leading score in the NHL could be leaving the Calgary Flames. Like that's just, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen in the NHL where guys with 115 points say sayonara. You're, it, you're right, because it almost feels like we're numb to the Goudreau talk. Like, it's just like, oh yeah, like, you know, he's a free agent. We've been it's talking about this for 12 Goudreau. months. Um, but your answer is Goudreau, Frank? Yeah, not even close. Okay. Like, where does it, where is it? That's what I, like, everyone's heard. <laughs> Islanders, Devils, Flyers. Is there some team that we haven't talked about? Like, they clearly must have something good. The fact that they're not even willing to engage really with the Flames. Like, that's yeah. that's what I keep coming back to is, they must have something in their pocket. The other one, not nearly on the same scale. Um, it, I'm really curious about Mason Marchman. Um, and, and we talked about his, his dad, Brian, passing away last week, tragically at the draft at age 53. Uh, such a tough week to turn around and now have this you know major milestone marquee moment that you've probably been dreaming of hitting free agency in your career. But they're thinking he's getting, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of Carter Verhage money, three times four and a half. He doesn't have the track record really to suggest that other than the fact that he put up 48 points in a UFA year. He didn't really play in the NHL before that. So that's a really tricky one, I think. But I'd imagine someone somewhere will pay it. Fair enough. Uh, let's stick on Goudreau then for the third question here. Uh, not not the most likely option, but your question is blank would be the Flames' best backup option if Goudreau were to leave town. Frank? I can't even hazard a guess. Oh. Um, <laughs> like, it, like I, the way I'm framing this is like if you were in the GM chair and Goudreau leaves, like who, who would be number two on your list? Is like, okay, that's the UFA we got to go get. No one. Okay. That would be my answer. I would say, I don't think there's a free agent out there that's close. And I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be ponying up any money, getting myself into trouble, chasing something because you didn't land it. Mm-hmm. I honestly and truly believe this. If the Calgary flames don't get Johnny Gaudreau, that they are going to be forced to trade Matthew Kachuk, and they're going to have to basically start over. Wow. Frank or Jason. Wow. I know. Um, Spicy. Yeah, I agree with Frank. There, there's no one that's going to go out there and score 115 points for you, right? Uh, I look at the style of how the Flames like to play under Daryl Sutter. And the one guy, and because they just saw firsthand, guys, mm-hmm. because uh, Evander Kane took Matthew Kachuk out of that series. What if they put him on the same line? And I, you know what? I said earlier about Malkin, I just like the juicy rivalries. What if Kane's all of a sudden in Calgary? Him and Kachuk, I'll tell you, Matthew Kachuk didn't like it when Kane was against him, but he would absolutely love, he would run around even more than he does at times if, if Kane was there. Now, Kane's not going to score like Goudreau straight up. He's not going to replace his points, right? You're going to have to hope that other guys down the line, maybe Manji Apani, somebody else in a different role will, will elevate. But if you look at just strictly wingers to score points, he might be your best option. He's not going to have to cost you as much either, but that might be your, your best option, Frank, if they don't want to tear it down. I, I, I don't. So put yourself in Matthew Kachuk's shoes. You're one year away from unrestricted free agency. Why would you sign long-term if Johnny's not back? Yeah, that's fair. I personally, yeah. I wouldn't, but I, I mean, I'm also not Matthew Kachuk. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, two more for you guys. Fourth one here. We talked about this a little bit in the last podcast. And again, we don't need to speculate into it too deep, but there is a blank percent chance that both Taves and Kane, both Taves and Kane finish next season with the Chicago Blackhawks. Frank. Fifty. I don't know. Fifty, fifty. I think it's hard to trade Taves. I think, I think Kane's going to, I think it's hard to trade Taves too. I was doing Mm -hmm. a hit today with, uh, 
Nick Kiprios and Justin Bourne on Sportsnet. And I said, I, I think it's hard to trade Taves. And he said, teams would be lining up. And I just said, maybe I'm reading the market wrong. I just don't, I don't think he has that much left. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's the experience factor. Maybe someone would if the Hawks retained half and clearly money is not an obstacle with their cap yeah. situation. They're actively offloading players. Um, I think the much better chance to go is Patrick Kane. And I also think if it's going to happen, it's going to happen in somewhat short order. Oh, yeah. I agree. I think Kane move Taves. You might be able to trade him if he has a good first half of the season, because then they would look and say, okay, he's healthy again. But right. Like, he had 37 points last year in 71 games. And, you know, it came off the, obviously the, the brutal uh, long COVID the year before that. So we'll see if, if he can come back and, and be the player that he was. It's been a long time since Taves has been a really good player though. Yeah, that's fair. All right. We're going to wrap it up with the points bet Canada bonus question. Shout out to points bet Canada live in Ontario. That is where we are going. Your last question. I'll get out of here quick. I just want a one word answer from you guys. Give me one word to describe the Leafs' decision to go with Matt Murray between the pipes. Frank? Risky. Jason? Ballsy. All right. And with that, I am out. That's another edition of Fill in the Blank. Now, speaking of Matt Murray, uh, I know Leaf fans are probably like, are you kidding me? Um, you, you look at... What if he's good, by the way? Yeah, well, that's what I was going to say. You know what? Like he, if, if you, if you want to... Like, still- the, the Sens have not been a good team. Yes. So much of what happens with goaltenders is dependent on what happens in front of them. He's no. clearly comfortable going to Toronto because he blocked the no trade to Buffalo thinking that Toronto might be an option. He's got the familiarity with the coach and the GM. What if he turns it around? He's one of those players that we saw in those cup runs that was supremely confident. He went to Ottawa and he barely looked human at times. Looked like you could see right through him. Does he get some swagger back? Well, well, here's the thing about Matt Murray. Like, yeah, you know, he struggled, but he still had a 906 save percentage, which it is, is basically the most misleading stat ever. He did have a really good stretch last year, but for... my God, he was bad for a while. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was bad, but he had a really good stretch from like, and then he got hurt, right? He had that good stretch from for like, I want to say 14 games. He was pretty solid. But then in the other ones, you're right. But when you have that stretch that still shows you're capable of it, and uh, it, to me, it's I'm, I'm more concerned. Frank, honestly, is can he stay healthy? Because I think it. when he plays, I think he can play. Honestly, I think he can. Because honestly, in today's NHL, you, you just need, need a nine fifty. No, you just all, need if, a, if you're the Leafs and you score that much, nine oh five probably gets it done. Oh, probably. But even nine fifteen, I, I would say realistically, you're comfortable with right, which is still pretty good. Heck, nine twelve, but. Can he stay healthy? And then the other question is who, cause I don't think you can overplay Matt Murray. He's never been a guy who plays tons of games. So who is going to be their kind of one B that they can get a comfortable 30 to 35 games from? That's the part. I don't know. Maybe that is Ilya Samsonov. I don't know. I'm just, uh, who, who else is out there? Like it's probably, I'm just going through the backup list. It's probably not, Charlie Lindgren, it's probably not Yarrow Halak, probably not Martin Jones. I don't I don't know. Like who who stands out to you? Well, that that, that to me is the question because he's never played more than 50 games, Frank. He's played 50 and 49, 49. So let's just say, you know, 32 games. Who do you like Dave Riddich? Right. Nope. Um, Been there, done that. Like, th- th- there's not you a watch him in Nashville in the playoffs. Yeah, I know. There's, there's not a, there's not a ton of guys, right? That uh, you know, you met Martin Jones. Like, I'm not sure how much, how much he's got left. Maybe, um, you know, Yarrow Halak's what, 37, 38. Like, you know what? They Toronto might be calling San Jose, right? Like, maybe they try to get Aiden Hill out of uh, out of San Jose. That would make sense. What? Right? I still didn't understand the Jake Allen rumors from Montreal, like. Well, he's their goalie, isn't he? If Carey Price can't play, who else are you putting in net? 100%. I didn't understand that from Jump Street when I saw it this weekend. Like, what? Yeah, it didn't. I still I... think uh, it's not going to happen with the Leafs because I don't think Lou Lamorello is handing the Leafs any... Varlamov? Uh, yeah, but I would have to think at some point, some team is desperate enough that they uh, just offer something that Lou Lamorello can't refuse. Yeah, that's fair. Right. What it is, is it? What? So, oh, well, I don't know. 
What do got? I'm 10 just million. trying to think who Eric Comrie, like who, who are some of the other guys out there? Eric Comrie, you know what? He's an interesting one. Um, he's not proven though. Right. So that'd be a risk. So then you'd need Comrie and you need a number three, right? So you can kind of go back and forth with them, right? That's, that's where they're at. So it's a, it's a tough, but a lot of teams still need number two. Hey, there, I was just going to say, there's lots of teams who need it. I like, uh, Buffalo I, I want... needs a one Chicago yeah. needs a two. Well, Samson off to Buffalo is the one that makes the most sense to me. They could pay him, right? They've got Anderson as a veteran guy to learn from and work with him a little bit. Cause I do think there's an advantage of having a veteran goalie sometimes rather than just a goalie coach with you, right? And Samsonov and Vanishek were battling. They're trying to be friends, but they're battling for the job. And they don't really have enough experience to, to give each other any insight on anything. So honestly, I think Samsonov to Buffalo makes a lot of sense to me. Louis Deming. I, I'm just, I, you run out of names quickly. No. Very quickly, unless there's some year like you, you, you know, Veg Melko is a great example. Like maybe there's some guy out there that we have, and there's always there's always two goalies, Frank, that we're going to talk about during the season. We're like, where'd that guy come from? Happens well, every that's year. The nature of the position, and that's why for everyone shitting on the Leafs, I, I'm no apologist. Just it's the most fickle position in sports. Yeah. I will say that Charlie Lindgren is going to get a lot of interest from teams. There's a Charlie lot. I've talked to a lot of like Mike McKenna. There's a lot of goalie guys yeah. who think Charlie Lindgren could be ready to pop as, you know, even as pop to be a solid, solid backup. Mike was saying this season, Charlie Lindgren was the best number three in the league. So yeah, that means that means when there are no goalies, you're now a number two. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if Miko Koskin, maybe he just wanted a lifestyle, but man, he might've read the tea leaves wrong. He probably could have been well sought after this summer. I, I tweeted that yesterday. He could have made 3 million bucks this summer. I don't know what he's getting in Lugano. Sort of the guys cap out in that league around 500, 700, 800 euros with rare exceptions. And maybe he's, he is one of those. And maybe it's just wanted to be closer to family or get out from uh, you and the Edmonton media um it feels like a tactical error yeah well he also made 13 and a half mil so maybe he's just like you know what i'm good i'm comfortable i can get all the euros and relax i do know i talked to miko the uh the lockout year not the lockout the covid year when he was away from his young kids and his wife like that really really weighed on him it was not easy and as, as a father i can understand it like that that's something that he just he i don't know if he ever really got over it it really bothered him and i and i can respect that from as, as a father we probably need more men like that so you know, that's a really good thing for him. And, but uh, yeah, you're right. He might've, he might've sold himself short, but maybe money isn't everything for him. He wants some, uh, some happiness and, you know, fewer games and, and play a lot longer and not be injured. But um, the, uh, the backup goaltender situation, Frank is going to be almost as uh, interesting as the, uh, the starting goaltenders. Although if we had to bet right now, Kemper, Washington, Campbell and uh, Edmonton would seem to be the uh, easy bets to make. Yes. Uh, and given that this is our, Last show before the, the free agency opens on at 12 noon on July 13th. Well, you may have some educated guesses. Yes, we will. Uh, and then we will have a breakdown on Thursday. We're going to have a special Thursday pod this week. Uh, usually we're Friday, but we'll do it Thursday after day one of uh, free agency. Frank, uh, feel better, and uh, we'll talk to you on Thursday. Thanks for listening to the DFO Rundown with Saravali and Gregor. Keep it locked on dailyfaceoff.com and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode. Delivered by DoorDash.